District School Number 7 stood on the very edge of that wild country which lies west of Arkham. It stood in a little grove of trees, chiefly oaks and elms with one or two maples. In one direction the road led to Arkham, in the other it dwindled away into the wild wooded country which always looms darkly on that western horizon. It presented a warmly attractive appearance to me when first I saw it on my arrival as the new teacher early in September 1920. Though it had no distinguishing architectural feature and was in every respect the replica of thousands of country schools scattered throughout New England, a compact, conservative building painted white, so that it shone forth from among the trees in the midst of which it stood. It was an old building at that time and no doubt has since been abandoned or torn down. The school district has now been consolidated, but at that time it supported this school in somewhat niggardly a manner, skimping and saving on every necessity. Its standard readers, when I came there to teach, were still McGuffey's eclectic readers in editions published before the turn of the century. My charges added up to twenty-seven. There were Allens and Waitleys and Perkinses, Dunlocks and Abbots and Talbots, and there was Andrew Potter. I cannot now recall the precise circumstances of my especial notice of Andrew Potter. He was a large boy for his age, very dark of mien, with haunting eyes and a shock of tousled black hair. His eyes brooded upon me with a kind of different quality which at first challenged me but ultimately left me strangely uneasy. He was in the fifth grade, and it did not take me long to discover that he could very easily advance into the seventh or eighth, but made no effort to do so. He seemed to have only a casual tolerance for his schoolmates, and for their part they respected him, but not out of affection so much as what struck me soon as fear. Very soon thereafter, I began to understand that this strange lad held for me the same kind of amused tolerance that he held for his schoolmates. Perhaps it was inevitable that the challenge of this pupil should lead me to watch him as surreptitiously as I could, and as the circumstances of teaching a one-room school permitted. As a result, I became aware of a vaguely disquieting fact. From time to time, Andrew Potter responded to some stimulus beyond the apprehension of my senses, reacting precisely as if someone had called to him, sitting up, growing alert, and wearing the air of someone listening to sounds beyond my own hearing, in the same attitude assumed by animals hearing sounds beyond the pitch levels of the human ear. My curiosity quickened by this time I took the first opportunity to ask about him. One of the eighth grade boys, Wilbur Dunlock, was in the habit on occasion of staying after school and helping with the cursory cleaning that the room needed. Wilbur, I said to him late one afternoon, I notice you don't seem to pay much attention to Andrew Potter, none of you. Why? He looked at me a little distrustfully and pondered his answer before he shrugged and replied, He's not like us. In what way? He shook his head. He don't care if we let him play with us or not. He don't want to. He seemed reluctant to talk, but by dint of repeated questions, I drew from him certain spare information. The Potters lived deep in the hills to the west along an all but abandoned branch of the main road that led through the hills. Their farm stood in a little valley locally known as Witch's Hollow, which Wilbur described as a bad place. There were only four of them, Andrew, an older sister, and their parents. They did not mix with other people of the district, not even with the Dunlocks, who were their nearest neighbors, living but half a mile from the school itself, and thus perhaps four miles from Witch's Hollow with woods separating the two farms. More than this he could not or would not say. About a week later I asked Andrew Potter to remain after school. He offered no objection, appearing to take my request as a matter of course. As soon as the other children had gone, he came up to my desk and stood there waiting, his dark eyes fixed expectantly on me and just the shadow of a smile on his full lips. I've been studying your grades, Andrew, I said, and it seems to me that with only a little effort you could skip into the sixth, perhaps even the seventh grade. Wouldn't you like to make that effort? He shrugged. What do you intend to do when you get out of school? He shrugged again. Are you going to high school in Arkham? He considered me with eyes that seemed suddenly piercing in their keenness, all lethargy gone. Mr. Williams, I'm here because there's a law says I have to be, he answered. There's no law says I have to go to high school. But aren't you interested, I pressed him. What I'm interested in doesn't matter. It's what my folks want that counts. Well, I'm going to talk to them, I decided on the moment. Come along, I'll take you home. 
For a moment, something like alarm sprang into his expression, but in seconds it diminished and gave way to that air of watchful lethargy so typical of him. He shrugged and stood waiting while I slipped my books and papers into the school bag I habitually carried. Then he walked docilely to the car with me and got in, looking at me with a smile that could only be described as superior. We rode through the woods in silence, which suited the mood that came upon me as soon as we had entered the hills. For the trees pressed close upon the road, and the deeper we went, the darker grew the wood, perhaps as much because of the lateness of that October day as because of the thickening of the trees. From relatively open glades we plunged into an ancient wood, and when at last we turned down the side road little more than a lane to which Andrew silently pointed, I found that I was driving through a growth of very old and strangely deformed trees. I had to proceed with caution. The road was so little used that underbrush crowded upon it from both sides, and oddly I recognized little of it for all my studies in botany though once I thought I saw saxifrage curiously mutated. I drove abruptly without warning into the yard before the potter house. The sun was now lost beyond the wall of trees and the house stood in a kind of twilight. Beyond it stretched a few fields, strung out up the valley. In one there were corn shocks, in another stubble, in yet another pumpkins. The house itself was forbidding, low to the ground, with half a second story, gambrel roofed with shuttered windows, and the outbuildings stood gaunt and stark, looking as if they had never been used. The entire farm looked deserted. The only sign of life was in a few chickens that scratched at the earth behind the house. Had it not been that the lane along which we had traveled ended here, I would have doubted that we had reached the potter house. Andrew flashed a glance at me as if he sought some expression on my face to convey to him what I thought. Then he jumped lightly from the car, leaving me to follow. He went into the house ahead of me. I heard him announce me. Brought the teacher, Mr. Williams. There was no answer. Then abruptly I was in the room, lit only by an old-fashioned kerosene lamp. And there were the other three potters. The father, a tall, stoop-shouldered man, grizzled and graying, who could not have been more than forty but looked much older, not so much physically as psychically. The mother, an almost obscenely fat woman, and the girl, slender, tall, and with that same air of watchful waiting that I had noticed in Andrew. Andrew made the brief introductions, and the four of them stood or sat, waiting upon what I had to say, and somewhat uncomfortably suggesting in their attitudes that I say it and get out. I wanted to talk to you about Andrew, I said. He shows great promise, and he could be moved up a grade or two if he'd study a little more. My words were not welcomed. I believe he's smart enough for eighth grade, I went on and stopped. If he's in eighth grade, said his father, he'd be having to go to high school, for he's old enough to get out of going to school. That's the law, they told me. I could not help thinking of what Wilbur Dunlock had told me of the reclusiveness of the potters, and as I listened to the elder potter and thought of what I had heard, I was suddenly aware of a kind of tension among them and a subtle alteration in their attitude. The moment the father stopped talking, there was a singular harmony of attitude. All four of them seemed to be listening to some inner voice, and I doubt that they heard my protest at all. "'You can't expect a boy as smart as Andrew just to come back here,' I said." Here's good enough, said old Potter, besides, he's ours. And don't you go talking about us now, Mr. Williams. He spoke with so latently menacing an undercurrent in his voice that I was taken aback. At the same time, I was increasingly aware of a miasma of hostility not proceeding so much from any one or all four of them as from the house and its setting themselves. Thank you, I said. I'll be going. I turned and went out, Andrew at my heels. Outside, Andrew said softly, you shouldn't be talking about us, Mr. Williams. Pa gets mad when he finds out. You talk to Wilbur Dunlock. I was arrested at getting into the car. With one foot on the running board, I turned. Did he say so? I asked. He shook his head. You did, Mr. Williams, he said, and backed away. It's not what he thinks, but what he might do. Before I could speak again, he had darted into the house. For a moment I stood undecided, but my decision was made for me. Suddenly, in the twilight, the house seemed to burgeon with menace, and all the surrounding woods seemed to stand waiting but to bend upon me. Indeed, I was aware of a rustling like the whispering of wind in all the wood, though no wind stirred, and from the house itself came a malevolence like the blow of a fist. 
I got into the car and drove away with that impression of malignance at my back like the hot breath of a ravaging pursuer. I reached my room in Arkham at last, badly shaken. Seen in retrospect, I had undergone an unsettling psychic experience. There was no other explanation for it. I had the unavoidable conviction that however blindly I had thrust myself into far deeper waters than I knew, and the very unexpectedness of the experience made it the more chilling. I could not eat for the wonder of what went on in that house in Witch's Hollow, of what it was that bound the family together, chaining them to that place, preventing a promising lad like Andrew Potter even from the most fleeting wish to leave that dark valley and go out into a brighter world. I lay for most of that night sleepless, filled with a nameless dread for which all explanation eluded me. And when I slept at last, my sleep was filled with hideously disturbing dreams, in which beings far beyond my mundane imagination held the stage, and cataclysmic events of the utmost terror and horror took place. And when I rose next morning, I felt that somehow I had touched upon a world totally alien to my kind. I reached the school early that morning, but Wilbur Dunlock was there before me. His eyes met mine with sad reproach. I could not imagine what had happened to disturb this usually friendly pupil. You shouldn't have told Andrew Potter we talked about him, he said with a kind of unhappy resignation. I didn't, Wilbur. I know I didn't, so you must have, he said, and then six of our cows got killed last night and the shed where they were was crushed down on them. I was momentarily too startled to reply. A sudden windstorm, I began, but he cut me off. Weren't no wind last night, Mr. Williams, and the cows were smashed. You surely cannot think that the potters had anything to do with this, Wilbur, I cried. He gave me a weary look, the look of one who knows, meeting the glance of one who should know but cannot understand, and said nothing more. This was even more upsetting than my experience of the previous evening. He at least was convinced that there was a connection between our conversation about the Potter family and the Dunlock's loss of half a dozen cows. And he was convinced with so deep a conviction that I knew without trying that nothing I could say would shake it. When Andrew Potter came in, I looked in vain for any sign that anything out of the ordinary had taken place since last I had seen him. Somehow I got through that day. Immediately after the close of the school session, I hastened into Arkham and went to the office of the Arkham Gazette the editor of which had been kind enough as a member of the local district board of education to find my room for me. He was an elderly man, almost seventy, and might presumably know what I wanted to find out. My appearance must have conveyed something of my agitation, for when I walked into his office his eyebrows lifted and he said, What's got your dander up, Mr. Williams? I made some attempt to dissemble since I could put my hand upon nothing tangible and viewed in the cold light of day what I might have said would have sounded almost hysterical to an impartial listener. I said only, I'd like to know something about a Potter family that lives in Witch's Hollow, west of the school. He gave me an enigmatic glance. Never heard of old wizard Potter, he asked. And before I could answer, he went on, No, of course, you're from Brattleboro. We could hardly expect Vermonters to know about what goes on in the Massachusetts back country. He lived there first, an old man when I first knew him. And these Potters were distant relatives, lived in Upper Michigan, inherited the property, and came to live there when Wizard Potter died. But what do you know about them? I persisted. Nothing but what everybody else knows, he said. When they came, they were nice, friendly people. Now they talk to nobody, seldom come out, and there's all that talk about missing animals from the farms in the district. The people tie that all up. Thus begun, I questioned him at length. I listened to a bewildering enigma of half-told tales, hints, legends, and lore utterly beyond my comprehension. What seemed to be incontrovertible was a distant cousinship between Wizard Potter and one Wizard Waitley of nearby Dunwich. A bad lot, the editor called him, the solitary way of life of old Wizard Potter, and the incredible length of time he had lived, the fact that people generally shunned Witch's Hollow. What seemed to be sheer fantasy was the superstitious lore that Wizard Potter had called something down from the sky and it lived with him or in him until he died. That a late traveler found in a dying state along the main road had gasped out something about that thing with the feelers, slimy, rubbery thing with the suckers on its feelers that came out of the woods and attacked him, and a good deal more of the same kind of lore. 
When he finished, the editor scribbled a note to the librarian at Miskatonic University in Arkham and handed it to me. Tell him to let you look at that book. You may learn something, he shrugged, and you may not. Young people nowadays take the world with a lot of salt. I went supperless to pursue my search for the special knowledge I felt I needed, if I were to save Andrew Potter for a better life. For it was this rather than the satisfaction of my curiosity that impelled me. I made my way to the library of Miskatonic University, looked up the librarian and handed him the editor's note. The old man gave me a sharp look, said, wait here, Mr. Williams, and went off with a ring of keys. So the book, whatever it was, was kept under lock and key. I waited for what seemed an interminable time. I was now beginning to feel some hunger and to question my unseemly haste, and yet I felt that there was little time to be lost, though I could not define the catastrophe I hoped to avert. Finally, the librarian came, bearing an ancient tome, and brought it around into a table within his range of vision. The book's title was in Latin, Necronomicon, though its author was evidently an Arabian, Abdul al-Hazred, and its text was in somewhat archaic English. I began to read with interest, which soon turned to complete bewilderment. The book evidently concerned ancient alien races, invaders of Earth, great mythical beings called Ancient Ones and Elder Gods, with outlandish names like Cthulhu and Hastur, Shub-Niggurath and Azathoth, Dagon and Ithakwa and Wendigo and Cthuga, all involved in some kind of plan to dominate Earth and served by some of its peoples, the Chocho and the Deep Ones and the like. It was a book filled with cabalistic lore, incantations, and what purported to be an account of a great interplanetary battle between the Elder Gods and the Ancient Ones, and of the survival of cults and servitors in isolated and remote places on our planet as well as on sister planets. What this rigmarole had to do with my immediate problem, with the ingrown and strange Potter family and their longing for solitude and their antisocial way of life was completely beyond me. How long I would have gone on reading I do not know. I was interrupted presently by the awareness of being studied by a stranger who stood not far from me with his eyes moving from the book I was busy reading to me. Having caught my eye, he made so bold as to come over to my side. Forgive me, he said, but what in this book interests a country school teacher? I wonder now myself, I said. He introduced himself as Professor Martin Keene. I may say, sir, he added, that I know this book practically by heart. A farrago of superstition. Do you think so? Emphatically. You have lost the quality of wonder, Mr. Williams. Tell me, if you will, what brought you to this book? I hesitated, but Professor Keene's personality was persuasive and inspired confidence. Let us walk, if you don't mind, I said. He nodded. I returned the book to the librarian and joined my newfound friend. Haltingly, as clearly as I could, I told him about Andrew Potter, the house in Witch's Hollow, my strange psychic experience, even the curious coincidence of Dunlock's cows. To all this he listened without interruption, indeed with a singular absorption. I explained at last that my motive in looking into the background of Witch's Hollow was solely to do something for my pupil. A little research, he said would have informed you that many strange events have taken place in such remote places as Dunwich and Innsmouth. Even Arkham and Witch's Hollow, he said when I had finished. Look around you at these ancient houses with their shuttered rooms and ill-lit fanlights. How many strange events have taken place under those gambrel roofs? We shall never know, but let us put aside the question of belief. One may not need to see the embodiment of evil to believe in it, Mr. Williams. I should like to be of some small service to the boy in this matter, may I? By all means, it may be perilous to you as well as to him. I am not concerned about myself, but I assure you it cannot be any more perilous to the boy than his present position. Even death for him is less perilous. You speak in riddles, Professor. Let it be better so, Mr. Williams. But come, we are at my residence. Pray come in. We went into one of those ancient houses of which Professor Keene had spoken. I walked into the musty past, for the rooms were filled with books and all manner of antiquities. My host took me into what was evidently his sitting room, swept a chair clear of books, and invited me to wait while he busied himself on the second floor. He was not, however, gone very long, not even long enough for me to assimilate the curious atmosphere of the room in which I waited. When he came back, he carried what I saw at once were objects of stone, roughly in the shape of five pointed stars. He put five of them into my hands. 
Tomorrow after school, if the Potter boy is there, you must contrive to touch him with one of these and keep it fixed upon him, said my host. There are two other conditions. You must keep one of these at least on your person at all times, and you must keep all thought of the stone and what you are about to do out of your mind. These beings have a telepathic sense, an ability to read your thoughts. Startled, I recalled Andrews charging me with having talked about them with Wilbur Dunlock. Should I not know what these are, I asked. If you can abate your doubts for the time being, my host answered with a grim smile. These stones are among the thousands bearing the Sea of Rallier, which closed the prisons of the Ancient Ones. They are the seals of the Elder Gods. Professor Keene, the age of superstition is past, I protested. Mr. Williams, the wonder of life and its mysteries is never past, he retorted. If the stone has no meaning, it has no power. If it has no power, it cannot affect young Potter. And it cannot protect you. From what? From the power behind the malignance you felt at the house in Witch's Hollow, he answered. Or was this too superstition? He smiled. You need not answer. I know your answer. If something happens when you put the stone upon the boy, he cannot be allowed to go back home. You must bring him here to me. Are you agreed? Agreed, I answered. That next day was interminable, not only because of the imminence of crisis, but because it was extremely difficult to keep my mind blank before the inquiring gaze of Andrew Potter. Moreover, I was conscious, as never before, of the wall of pulsing malignance at my back, emanating from the wild country mere, a tangible menace hidden in a pocket of the dark hills. But the hours passed, however slowly, and just before dismissal I asked Andrew Potter to wait after the others had gone. And again he assented with that casual air tantamount almost to insolence so that I was compelled to ask myself whether he were worth saving as I thought of saving him in the depths of my mind. But I persevered. I had hidden the stone in my car and once the others were gone I asked Andrew to step outside with me. At this point I felt both helpless and absurd. I, a college graduate, about to attempt what for me seemed inevitably the kind of mumbo-jumbo that belonged to the African wilderness. And for a few moments, as I walked stiffly from the schoolhouse toward the car, I almost flagged, almost simply invited Andrew to get into the car to be driven home. But I did not. I reached the car with Andrew at my heels, reached in, seized a stone to slip into my own pocket, seized another, and turned with lightning rapidity to press the stone to Andrew's forehead. Whatever I expected to happen, it was not what took place. For at the touch of the stone, an expression of the utmost horror shone in Andrew Potter's eyes. In a trice, this gave way to poignant anguish. A great cry of terror burst from his lips. He flung his arms wide, scattering his books, wheeled as far as he could with my hold upon him, shuddered and would have fallen had I not caught him and lowered him, foaming at the mouth to the ground. And then I was conscious of a great cold wind which whirled about us and was gone, bending the grasses and the flowers, rippling the edge of the wood, and tearing away the leaves at the outer band of trees. Driven by my own terror, I lifted Andrew Potter into the car, laid the stone on his chest, and drove as fast as I could into Arkham, seven miles away. Professor Keene was waiting, no whit surprised at my coming. And he had expected that I would bring Andrew Potter, for he had made a bed ready for him, and together we put him into it, after which Keene administered a sedative. Then he turned to me. Now then, there's no time to be lost. They'll come to look for him, the girl probably first. We must get back to the schoolhouse at once. But now the full meaning and horror of what had happened to Andrew Potter had dawned upon me, and I was so shaken that it was necessary for Keene to push me from the room and half-drag me out of the house. And again, as I set down these words so long after the terrible events of that night, I find myself trembling with that apprehension and fear which seize hold of a man who comes for the first time face to face with the vast unknown and knows how puny and meaningless he is against that cosmic immensity. I knew in that moment that what I had read in that forbidden book at the Miskatonic Library was not a farrago of superstition, but the key to a hitherto unsuspected revelation perhaps far, far older than mankind in the universe. I did not dare to think of what Wizard Potter had called down from the sky. I hardly heard Professor Keene's words as he urged me to discard my emotional reaction and think of what had happened in scientific, more clinical fashion. After all, I had now accomplished my objective. Andrew Potter was saved. 
but to ensure it he must be made free of the others who would surely follow him and find him. I thought only of what waiting horror that quartet of country people from Michigan had walked into when they came to take up possession of the solitary farm in Witch's Hollow. I drove blindly back to school. There, at Professor Keene's behest, I put on the lights and sat with the door open to the warm night while he concealed himself behind the building to wait upon their coming. I had to steel myself in order to blank out my mind and take up that vigil. On the edge of night the girl came, and after she had undergone the same experience as her brother and lay beside the desk, the star-shaped stone on her breast, their father showed up in the doorway. All was darkness now, and he carried a gun. He had no need to ask what had happened, he knew. He stood wordless, pointed to his daughter and the stone on her breast and raised his gun. His inference was plain. If I did not remove the stone, he meant to shoot. Evidently, this was the contingency the professor expected, for he came upon Potter from the rear and touched him with the stone. Afterward, we waited for two hours in vain for Mrs. Potter. She isn't coming, said Professor Keene at last. She harbors the seat of its intelligence. I had thought it would be the man. Very well. We have no choice. We must go to Witch's Hollow. These two can be left here. We drove through the darkness, making no attempt at secrecy, for the professor said the thing in the house in the hollow knew we were coming, but could not reach us past the talisman of the stone. We went through that close pressing forest down the narrow lane where the queer undergrowth seemed to reach out toward us in the glow of the headlights into the potter yard. The house stood dark save for a wan glow of lamplight in one room. Professor Keene leaped from the car with his little bag of star-shaped stones and went around sealing the house, with a stone at each of the two doors and one at each of the windows, through one of which we could see the woman sitting at the kitchen table. Stolid, watchful, aware, no longer dissembling, looking unlike that tittering woman I had seen in this house not long ago, but rather like some great sentient beast at bay. When he had finished, my companion went around to the front and by means of brush collected from the yard and piled against the door, set fire to the house heedless of my protests. Then he went back to the window to watch the woman explaining that only fire could destroy the elemental force but that he hoped still to save Mrs. Potter. Perhaps you'd better not watch, Williams. I did not heed him. Would that I had, and so spared myself the dreams that invade my sleep even yet. I stood at the window behind him and watched what went on in that room, for the smell of smoke was now permeating the house. Mrs. Potter, or what animated her gross body, started up, went awkwardly to the back door, retreated, to the window, retreated from it, and came back to the center of the room between the table and the wood stove, not yet fired against the coming cold. There she fell to the floor, heaving and writhing. The room filled slowly with smoke, hazing about the yellow lamp making the room indistinct, but not indistinct enough to conceal completely what went on in the course of that terrible struggle on the floor where Mrs. Potter threshed about as if in mortal convulsion, and slowly, half visibly, something other took shape, an incredible amorphous mass, only half glimpsed in the smoke, tentacled, shimmering with a cold intelligence and a physical coldness that I could feel through the window. The thing rose like a cloud above the now motionless body of Mrs. Potter, and then fell upon the stove and drained into it like vapor. The stove! cried Professor Keene and fell back. Above us out of the chimney came a spreading blackness like smoke gathering itself briefly there. Then it hurtled like a lightning bolt aloft into the stars in the direction of the Hyades back to that place from which old Wizard Potter had called it into himself. Away from where it had lain in wait for the potters to come from Upper Michigan and afford it new host on the face of Earth. We managed to get Mrs. Potter out of the house, much shrunken now, but alive. On the remainder of that night's events there is no need to dwell how the professor waited until fire had consumed the house to collect his store of star-shaped stones, of the reuniting of the Potter family, freed from the curse of Witch's Hollow and determined never to return to that haunted valley, of Andrew who, when we came to waken him was talking in his sleep of great winds that fought and tore, and a place by the Lake of Molly where they live in glory forever. What it was that old wizard Potter had called down from the stars, I lacked the courage to ask, but I knew that it touched upon secrets better left unknown to the races of men, secrets I would never have become aware of had I not chanced to take district school number seven, 
and had among my pupils the strange boy who was Andrew Potter. <laughs>